like that old gospel song that John Newton wrote, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me, I once was lost, but now I'm found. He was blind, but now I see. I like this verse. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. That's probably your testimony this morning. This grace. surprised to learn, and, and this, this helps me, and it, it should help you, because sometimes we think that unless you're a conservative, you can't go to heaven. We had a guy tell me that, well, you know, people who believe in such and such a thing, you know, and they're, they're progressives, they, they're not going to heaven. No, you can't say that. Because I'm going to tell you, <laughs> Andy and Margot Grant are two of the most progressive. don't believe it, just ask them. They'll tell you. But I'm going to tell you, they are also two of the most wonderful Jesus followers. I told you about my friend Andy sitting up front here right in the middle uh, with some kind of bright colors on. And when I saw Cody come in this morning, I'm thinking, oh, he's trying to be Andy Grant today. <laughs> Shoo, wait. I almost need sunglasses. great to see you today. Yeah. The, the crowd's getting better. People are coming back from vacations. Thank you, Jesus. I Amen. Love I love the I, I noticed that, yes. Yeah, he even asked me if it'd be okay. I thought, it's okay with me. Whatever you, whatever you feel like you want to do, it's, it, it's great. Will you turn to the person next to you? If you have somebody next to you, Harry doesn't. I'll just come over here and stand next to him. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, Make up folks next to me, you know. Turn to the person next to you and say, man, I'm glad to see you today. I'm glad to see you both today. I'm glad to see you, yes. Amen. 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 Well, uh, I will tell you that this, oh, I, I wanted to remind you, you men of this, all right? And, and I'm doing this not because Cody is paying me or asking me. In fact, the truth is he would, he would probably feel better if I didn't. I want to tell you, and I mentioned this last Sunday, and we gave every man who was here a copy of this last week. The extra copies are in the foyer, okay? And I want to tell you, if you're a man, and, and women, you, ladies, you can read this too, and it'll bless you, it'll encourage you, but you need to, it's the finest, the finest piece on what it means to be a husband, to be a dad, that I've, I've read in a long time. I've asked Cody for permission. I'm getting ready to submit this to two 
convocations that the Church of the Nazarene puts out. One is, is called Holiness Today. It's a monthly publication, and they love these kinds of articles. And I'm going to submit it to them and, and another publication that comes out on a quarterly basis. But I'm telling you, this is fine. promote this, all right? It, I believe in it. I believe in what I read in it. And uh, I think every man, whether you're a father, or whether you're married or single, every man ought to read that. Okay? All right. Well, this has been the week that was. My poor wife got back from, I, I told her the other day, I said, you know, I, you can never, ever again go to Winter Haven by yourself. You just can't do that. Because you come home crippled up, that's not good. And uh, you know what happened to her while she was up on the night before she left, Louise Woods, who is our, our good friend, gets our mail and, and looks after our house. Louise dropped her off at the house, and Barb said, I turned around to close the door and felt the worst pain in my back. And, and then she got home. And when I picked her up at the airport, I mean, normally if you're in a wheelchair, they'll wheel you out to the sidewalk. I wheeled her all the way up to the car, and she could hardly get in. I said, what was going on? She said, well, I don't know. I, I hurt my back, and it, it went downhill from there. We've been to the, well, I want to say patient first. That's what we had in Florida. Um, we've been there twice. Um, we've been to a chiropractor, and finally on Friday. I mean, in the chiropractor's office, and even before we got there, I mean, she just cried. what we should have done in the first place to go to the ER. I don't care where it is. The ER is not the most fun place to go. And if you don't have some time, don't go there. Okay? We got there a little after 2. We got home at 8 o'clock Friday night. Okay? Now, in all fairness, we actually got home at 7, but she said, man, I'm really hungry. I said, so am I. We didn't have dinner. So we got something to eat with about the time we got home was 8 o'clock. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to report to you that they discovered that not only did she have this strained back, but she had a UTI that she didn't know she had. And so now she has, bed, she has med meds for the UTI and uh, pain medicine for the back, and she's doing better. Uh, I want to tell you that in all of this, I got a great promotion. Okay, You guys love this. I have become now in our house the chief cook and bottle washer. Okay? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I fixed the meals, I, I washed the dishes. I actually uh, got out the Swiffer and Swiffer the floors this week. <laughs> she said, you know, at this rate, I may never get wet. <laughs> no, she didn't say that. <laughs> this is being recorded. And, and she said, so, so what, what's the message today? And I gave her the thing. She said, oh, uh, can, I, can I just go to YouTube and see it as it happens? I said, no, no, I'll have to upload it. You'll have to see it later. She said, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So I have to be careful what I say because it could come back to haunt me or bite me or, or whatever. I don't, I don't know. But anyway. Well, um, I, had, uh, I had planned the sermons for the whole month of June. And so this, the message I want to bring today, uh, you know, has been on the docket since the beginning of the month not knowing that all of this other stuff was going to happen. And, and so I want to share with you this morning, uh, I've touched on this theme before, in fact, I think, I was looking back, I, I think about the second or third Sunday I was here that I, I preached out of this passage, it's my, one of my favorite passages in the whole New Testament, it's the book of Romans, chapter 8. So if you have your Bible, would, would you turn there? Romans, chapter 8, and, and we're going to look toward the end of, of chapter 8. The chapter 8 has some wonderful, wonderful verses in it. But there's one I want to call your attention to. It's in verse 37. Have you found it? Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Here's what Paul writes. I'm not reading 
this verse, <coughs> pardon me, which is a quote. And Paul says, he begins verse 37 with the word no. Um, if you were to read the whole passage, that would fit. But I, I want to call your attention to these words. In all these things, we are more get a whole lot out of this message this morning, but I needed it after my week this week. I was talking to somebody this week, oh, I was talking to Jacob about being counselors at youth camp. He's a counselor at youth camp, which is a good thing, and all the fun you have as a counselor. And I used to do that, and uh, Yes, I did it so well that I became camp director to senior high and junior high camps. And, and uh, one, one summer, uh, we, uh, we, had, we always had these groups come anyway. <clears throat> but our regional college was in Boston, Eastern Nazarene College. And, and they would always send representatives to our youth camps. And most of the time, the representatives was in the form of a youth a musical group. And one summer, a quartet came. I, I don't remember all of their names. I just remember one, Noah Tharp, who actually went on uh, after his graduation to sing with a major quartet and then went on to be a successful pastor somewhere. Noah Tharp at this time would not be quite my age, but he wouldn't be too far, too far behind. We sang this men's quartet, and uh, the first night they sang this song that went this way, if I can just hold out till tomorrow, if I can just hold out till tomorrow, if I can just hold out till tomorrow, I know the Lord is going to bring a better day. And, and, and it always ended this way because they wanted to highlight Noah Tharp, who was a great faith singer. And it would end this way. I know the Lord is going to bring a better day. And every night he would go lower, and they sang that song every night. If I can just hold out till tomorrow. Now, there's nothing theologically wrong with that song. But if I understand what the Apostle Paul is, is saying in, in the text I've asked you to share with me this morning, if I understand that, Paul is not interested in just holding out until tomorrow so that God could bring a better day in our life. What Paul is interested in us being more than conquerors in all of the situations that may come our way. And, and so, uh, say, no, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Well, there are three things in, in this passage of Scripture that I want to share with you this morning that helps us understand why Paul was so excited and so positive. don't have them in the church of God. But I can tell you, we have them in the church of the Israel. They're so negative, you know, oh, you, you poor me, you poor me, oh, I've got this problem. I got. Listen, can I tell you, and you know this, we all have problems, don't we? I want to say that again because some of you are afraid to confess. You, you, 
you don't want to confess because your husband or your wife is sitting next to you, your kids, and, and they're going to think that you're talking about them. Yeah. We all have problems in life, yeah. don't we? Yeah. Certainly. Certainly. So what is our attitude about those issues? saying, just trying to hold out. Oh, if we could just, oh, if we could just make it through the day. If we could just make it through this week. I mean, I've had people say to me, yo, Pastor, you know, it's been such a bad week or a bad month. If I can just, if I can just see the end of this week or the end of this month, I know next month is going to be better. Well, there's nothing wrong with having that kind of an outlook necessarily, but that's not what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying is, well, no matter what happens in our week, no matter what happens in our month, we don't have to be downhearted and disturbed about it. Why? Because Paul said, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So, says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. And sometimes we want to put the period there. But Paul didn't put the period there. He goes on to say, who have been called according to God's purpose. If you're a child of God this morning, if you've been saved and filled with the Spirit of God, this promise is for you that in all things, God is working for our good. Do you believe that today? Boy, I have to tell you, I don't understand uh, sitting in, in doctor's offices and, and, and I don't, you know, I, don't, I want to say, Lord, why am I here? Why, what, what is it that I have to learn out of this? And I'm not sure I know the answer to that question, but here's what I do know. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. And, and poor, our poor son, Tech, is trying to figure out why I don't have this thing on. I don't know why. It's just part of the week. I'm not going to repeat. And everybody said, hey, man, please don't start again. In all, I like that little word, all. Do you like that word? Just, just three letters. But it is one of the most inclusive words in the English language. You, you see, Paul didn't say God works in some things or God works in a few things. Or God might work in your situation. Paul said that God works in all things. Aren't you glad? Now, we made an understanding. I mean, things have happened in my life. I'm sure things have happened in your life. And you say, man, what is, what is that about? What, what, why? And, and sometimes there's no answer to that. I, I believe sometimes we have issues that come up in our lives, and we say, well, wh wh where did that come from? And, and what's about, <clears throat> what is that about? And we may not know the answer to that until we get to heaven. My, uh, my pastor, Barb and I was pastor, when we were teenagers, was A.C. McKenzie, a wonderful man of us in heaven. I heard him preach a message one time uh, in, in the Bridgeton Church where we grew up <clears throat> about not understanding what happens in life. And, and when he gave this illustration, well, I, I resonated with it because my mom was an embroiderer. Do you, do you know what embroider? I don't think people embroider very much anymore. But mom was. 
you know, you, you get the pattern and you, you put the hoop around it and then you, with different threads, you know, you, and, and, and it forms a beautiful picture on the top. And Pastor McKenzie said, turn it over. And when you turn it over, it's a bunch of strings hanging down. And, you know, it, 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 it in no way represents the picture on the top. And he said, life is like that. <laughs> Things happen in your life that make absolutely no sense at all. And we're saying, well, where did that come from? And what is it about? What is that about? It all goes into the picture. God is painting in our lives and we may not see it till we get to heaven and the picture is turned over. Oh, 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 I get it now. I understand it now. I know what Paul meant when he said that all things work together for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Amen. Well, not only not only did Paul have confidence because he understood that, but secondly, in this passage, Paul had confidence because he understood God's grand purpose for us. You know, if you're a Christian, you're not just here to take up space. understood uh, <laughs> any of the themes of the songs that we all heard this morning. We are here, first of all, to glorify God in our lives. We'll get to that in a minute. That, that's, that's why we sing. That's why we praise God. To do what? To give him the honor and the glory for who he is and what he has done in our lives grace that he has bestowed in our lives. I'm reading a book, uh, What Makes Grace So Amazing? It's on my desk. Powerful book about grace and why it is so amazing. That's why Newton wrote that song. So when you think about grace, you see grace is something <clears throat> that none of us deserve. And yet, God really bestows it in our lives. Amen. So Paul says, God has a grand purpose for us. And, and, and I want to quickly kind of just walk through this. <clears throat> it involves this, first of all. Uh, in, in verse 29, if you have your Bible open there, <clears throat> for those God foreknew, he also predestined. Now, we, we Wesleyans, we Church of God folks, we Nazarene folks, we Wesleyan Methodist folks, we Pilgrim Holiness folks, and we Independent Holiness who believe in, in uh, the fullness of the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit folks. We all get a little edgy at that word predestined. Because when we hear that word, we begin to think about our brothers and sisters who are part of some Baptist organization because that's the theology you find in a number of Baptist churches, that God has predetermined your life. He has predestined your life. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can change that's going to make a difference. God has determined your life. God has determined whether you're going to heaven or you're going to hell. So, well, well, Pastor, is that, is that what Paul is saying? No, no, no. No, don't miss this. For God, for those who God foreknew, he also predestined to be what? To be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. You see, that's what the issues of life are. <laughs> that's what the problems that come along that we don't get. 
the ones that God works in even when we don't see it. That's what that's all about. Because God uses those issues and those problems to mold and to shape our lives. And the molding and the shaping, I will tell you this morning, is not always pleasant. But the outcome, the end product, will be that we would be like Jesus. And everybody said, what he said. Oh, there you go. There you go. I, I like the words of, I think his name was Thomas Chisholm. He wrote this poem and it was put to music later on. He, 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 he makes this statement. He said, I have one sweet supreme desire that I might be like Jesus to this I fervently aspire I want to be like Jesus I want my, my heart his throne to be so that a watching world may see his likeness did you get it? his likeness shining forth in me I want to be like Jesus is that your, is that your desire this morning? That's what God is doing in you. He is molding and shaping and forming so that you can be like Jesus. And after all, we who love Jesus and understand that, that what we have found in our relationship with him, others need to find a relationship with him so that they can experience what we have experienced in that relationship. And how does that work? It works best when we go out into the world with the purpose, the goal, and the desire to be like Jesus. Amen? And hopefully, those who we come in contact with will see Jesus in our lives. The molding and the shaping. Don't ever resent the issues of life that come your way. Well, you say, but Pastor, they're not always, they're sometimes painful. I understand that. But what God is doing, doing something in you to create in you So that wherever you go and whoever you talk to, people are going to sense, first of all, they're going to sense there's something different about you. And secondly, they're going to respond to that. Because one of the things when we are like Jesus, we love folks, all kinds of folks. We love them. Amen? But it goes on to say, he foreknew, he predetermined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn of many brothers, and those he predetermined, he also called. Do you remember the day when God called you? It, it may have been in, in a revival service somewhere. It may have just been in a, in a regular Sunday worship service. And the Spirit of God was so rich and so real. I love those services. What I've discovered, when, when the Spirit of God comes on his church, there's something special about that, and it's so special that people don't want to leave. Perhaps it was in a service like that when God called your name. <laughs> I, I love this, this verse in, in uh, 
it's in Isaiah. Chapter 49, verse 16. When God spoke through the prophet Isaiah and said this, See, I have written your name on the palms of my hands. Wow, that encourages me that when God looks down on the palms of his hands, my name is written there somewhere. And your name, you say, well, how can he write off? Listen, God is God. And your name is written there. If you're a child of God, your name is written there. He calls you by name. Then, Paul says in that passage, those he called, he also justified. You say, well, what in the world does it mean to be justified? I, I, I think about that term like this. In the sight of God, when you're justified and you're forgiven, that in the sight of God, it is just as though you never sinned. Listen, when God forgets, he, when, when, pardon me, when God forgives, he forgets. And in the sight of God, because of Jesus, because of his shed blood on the cross, We are justified in the sight of God when our sins have been forgiven. There are four things that happen in your life and happened in my life the day that we came to Jesus and confessed our sin. These things happen simultaneously. I shared them with you this morning. The first thing that happens is when you confess your sins, you're forgiven. Aren't you glad? John writes in his little book, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I want to tell you, there's nothing better than being forgiven. For God to put your sin under his blood, the blood or me, under the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, never to be remembered against you anywhere. That's one of the beautiful things about, uh, about being a Christian, about being saved, is that your sins are washed away. And when you stand before God at judgment, they're not going to come back to haunt you. They're not there anymore. Amen. But, but see, not only are we forgiven, but Paul said we're justified in the sight of God. It's just as though we've never sinned. And the third thing that happens is that in that moment, God puts within us the precious Holy Spirit. Now, we Wesleyan holiness folks sometimes get confused over that. I mean, I've heard Naz and you, you, Church of God folks would never say this. But I've heard Nazarene folks in fact, I had one, one young man stand up and say one time, well, you know, Pastor, uh, I understand what you're talking about because, uh, you know, first the first thing that happens is God saves you and, and, and you, you get Jesus, and then when you get sanctified, you get the Holy Spirit. I said, no, it doesn't work that way. When you get saved, God puts in you his Holy Spirit. And you get all of the Spirit there is to get. You say, well, if that's the case, then what's the difference between that and when we talk about being filled with the Spirit and having our hearts cleansed? Well, the difference is this. When you get saved, God gives you His Spirit. All of His Spirit there is to get. Differences between that and a sanctifying experience. When you get sanctified, God has all of you. Because sanctification involves consecration and giving.
ourselves. And then the last thing that happens to me is the most precious thing. We are adopted into the family of God. Woo, aren't you glad? Fellow told me one time, you know, I sure wish I'd been born into the, to, uh, what's the God's name? Oh, the, the Steve Jobs family. He's got all the money in the world. And I said, well, you know, okay, uh, if, if, if that's what you're looking for, but I want to tell you there's something far better. He said, what's that? I said, to be adopted into the family of God. <laughs> God not only has all the money, he owns it all. Steve Jobs just thinks it belongs to him. Adoption is always a special subject for Barb and I because our boys are adopted. Something about adoption you may not know that, and then it's this, and I think I know it's true in Virginia, I know it's true in Texas, I believe it's true in all the states. When you adopt a child, you cannot disinherit that child. You can disinherit a natural child, but you cannot disinherit an adopted child. Now think about that. You're adopted into the family of God. And God is not going to disinherit you. And, and what that means is, is that is that whatever God is, whatever Jesus is heir to, and, and we have no idea what that is, we are heir to. We're brothers. That's what Paul said. We're heir to. Nothing better than being adopted into the family of God. And then Paul said, you know, not only are we, are we called, but we're glorified. Now, <clears throat> that term glorified is used here in, in really uh, a future tense because it is true <laughs> that the end of salvation is to leave this world and receive a glorified body. You, you know you can't go to heaven in your present state. The beautiful thing is, in that moment of death, when our soul leaves our body, God clothes that soul with a glorified body and lives in the presence of Jesus. The glory of glory of God, and, and we're glorified, and, and, and God's glory, as we live here on this earth, God's glory is placed in us. I like what Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. He, he talks about the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire. That you might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, who, having not seen, you love. In whom, though you now see him not, yet you believe. You rejoice, Peter says, with joy unspeakable and full of glory. There's something about the glory of God and the glory of his presence in our lives. And then the third thing that Paul said that he's encouraged about is that verse 31 and 32 
God is for us. Aren't you glad this morning? So it's always good to have people who are for you. It's always good as a, as a child when your parents believe in you and they're for you. It's great as a child of God to know that God believes in us and God is for us. So that in all of those things that come, the things that we don't get, the things that we don't understand, we know this, that God is for us in all of them. And somehow, some way, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Why? Because he is for us. And Paul says this, if God is for us, who can be against us? I preached a sermon one time on that passage entitled, If and Who. If God is for us, then who? The simple answer is no one. No one. No one. And the great news I have for you today, and the great news that, that God has reminded me of this week, and this weekend especially, hey, listen, I understand what's going on. You may not. I understand all of it. And I want you to know I'm for you. You are going to come out victorious. And I hope that's true because I want my promotion at home just to be temporary. When my wife comes and she's lost 50 pounds, you know it's the cooked problem. Amen. Well, Let's pray together. Lord, it, it, it's so easy to get all wrapped up in issues of life. And that's Satan's business. But today, the word is that God works in all things for the good of those who love the Lord. And the word is this morning in that wonderful passage in, in, in our text today, verse 37, where, where Paul writes, in all these things, all these things, there's that little word again, all these things, we are more than Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this powerful word. May our hearts be encouraged today as we prepare to leave. In Christ's name, we ask you. Let's stand and sing together.